Why am I suffering? The Bible actually has a lot to say about this. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 17 says, It is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. So Peter gives us these two categories. We suffer sometimes because we're doing good, and it's God's will that we suffer. The life of Jesus is just the perfect example. Jesus always did good, he never did evil, and he suffered greatly. Why? Because God cares more about our fruitfulness, about our future glorification, um, about the tested genuineness of our faith than he does about our best life now. So when God allows us to suffer while we're doing good, we're trying to obey him, he's actually treating us like his only begotten son. But sometimes we suffer because we do evil things, because we do foolish things. So what do we do with that? Well, we remember, um, as Hebrews says, that every son he loves, he chastens. The suffering that we experience for doing evil and stupid things is God saying to us, I love you too much to let you go on in this evil, to let you go on down this path that leads to destruction. So uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 6, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Hang on to Jesus. God is strengthening your faith, which is more precious than gold and silver, so that in the end, you will be glorious and unashamed as you stand before God. Well, good morning, friends. We're really glad that you're here. Let's sing together. Okay.
stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? No one can. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. And our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. And every knee Amen. Revelation 5 and verse 5 says, Weep no more for the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered. Conquered what? Sin. Death. The devil. And everything that stands against those who stand with him. That's why we're here this morning, friends. So to all who are weary and need a conquering friend, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who fail and desire strength from on high, and to everyone who sins and needs a Savior, this church opens wide her doors with a welcome from the Savior. Welcome. Okay, let's get this thing kicked off now. Though the whole world should be allied against him, Jesus has conquered the world. Though every sin known to man should suddenly rise up and condemn us, Jesus has conquered sin. Though our own heart should condemn us, Jesus is greater than our heart. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Then let's worship like those who have conquered through Christ. When we're about to sing these, these words. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. And that comes straight from Hebrews 6. And this is a hymn about the true hope we have in Christ in the midst of suffering. And the visual here is anchors that go up. Our hope is anchored in Christ in heaven who by his blood has prepared a place for us behind the veil in the holy of holies in the very presence of God forever. So with this hope, let's sing, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Darkness fails his lovely face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking. Come 
And all my hope is in you. It's in you, Jesus. All my strength is in you. And all my peace is in you. Perfect. And all
Amen. You can be seated. We're going to continue in worship with a prayer, but before we do that, I just want to say uh, on behalf of my family, of Jessica and I, and our children, thank you for the way that you celebrated us last uh, week with a picnic. We could think of no uh, better way, yeah, sweets and picnics, of saying, um, you know, we love you and we know that you love us beyond doubt. Um, By the way that you, you are a church that knows how to love. And we have been the recipient of your love. And we're just so grateful. Wasn't it fun having a picnic? You know, we could do that every week. Just a thought. By we, I mean mainly not us. Because with the kids, you get it. Um, Thank you, friends. Uh, We're going to go to a time of prayer. And at Emmanuel, it's our hope that if you hang, hang around with us long enough, um, that you actually learn something about how to pray. And I just want to say, I just want to own it in front of everybody, I'd, I'm not good at praying. And actually, guys, if I'm totally honest, as soon as I hit my knees and bow my head, a million things start running through my mind. And I find it so hard to focus. And actually... That's a pretty common experience in uh, the life of Christians throughout the ages, and God knows that. He's not surprised by that, which is why the Bible has so much to say about prayer. So when we sit down and our thoughts just start racing, what we do in that moment is not to muster up more willpower, but to go to the thoughts of God and to, as it were, let the thoughts of God be our thoughts which is why there's so much about prayer in the Bible. For instance, in John chapter 17, Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples just before he's about to be betrayed by Judas. And he prays a prayer for the people that are in the room, but he also prays for the people who aren't yet in the room. He prays for you. And God puts these prayers in the Bible so that actually, when we don't even know what to say, we can just go read the prayers of Jesus. We can let the prayer of the Son of God be our prayer. We can receive that everything Jesus prays for, he gets. (laughs) So, What I want to do this morning is pray. Uh, I I just want to read the prayer that that Jesus prayed to the Father and let that be our prayer and let the implications of that just land on us this morning that God is answering the prayers of the Son of God. And so would you go with me to prayer? When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me. And they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me. For they are yours. All mine are yours. And yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. 
And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. Amen. Thank you, friends. We're going to go now to our time of giving, and here's an amazing thing about where we are right now. We are a growing family, and anyone who has a growing family knows that growing families are expensive, right? And that's wonderful. So we have like loads of needs right now because the Lord keeps sending loads of, of His precious children to us. And so we have the great privilege, for instance, of raising up a hundred and some odd kids under the age of eight years old or something for the glory of God and the next generation. That's amazing. So I want you to know that um, the way that you invest in the kingdom of God at Emmanuel Church, I want you to know the majority of the fruit of that investment you will never see in this world. And that's great, because long after you're gone, you can, your dollars can still be serving King Jesus by the investment that you're making in this church. That's amazing. So, you know, we're going to be up in heaven, um, and we're going to be watching this tidal wave of blessing um, be unleashed on the world, because we just had the privilege of, you know, being right here at the right time to invest. So let's give. Let's give like we will want to have given when we're on the other side of the veil looking back down. All right, there are three ways to give. It's pretty self-explanatory. So now we remember. All things come from you, O Lord, and of your own have we given you. And if Christ is in you, 
If Christ is in you, if Christ is in you, you have life. If Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if Christ is in you, if Christ is in you, if Christ is in you, you have life. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, dwells in you. He who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your body. Through His Spirit, if Christ, if Christ is in you, if Christ is in you, if Christ is in you, you have life. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if Christ is in you, if Christ is in you, if Christ is in you, you have life. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, dwells in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your bodies through his spirit. But if Christ is in you, if Christ is in you, if Christ is in you, you have life. If Christ is in you, if Christ is in you, if Christ is in you, you have life. Good morning. If you have your Bibles, open up to Colossians chapter 2. We've been going through this series, All of Christ for All of Life, and that brings us here. One of our convictions as a church is we let the Holy Spirit set the agenda. So, the way that we're preaching through Colossians is to simply turn the page. And, and the next thing that comes up, that's what we preach, and that's what the Lord has for us. Um, in this particular portion, it's this uh, major shifting point in the book of Colossians. Paul here has given us a, uh, a, an insight to the fatherly heart of God through the way that he disciples and handles the Colossians. And uh, j just like a, a proud father who sees this church, who sees, a, who sees a son or a daughter, and through them he sees all of the things that he wants them to be, all the aspirations that he has for them, all the potential and all the potential downfalls and pitfalls as well. So Paul sees this church and addresses them as such. He has this, lovingly, this, this loving urgency for them to essentially guard what they've been given. And uh, earlier in the chapter, in verse 4, he says this, 
I say this in order that no one may delude you by plausible arguments. He sees, he sees that there are these potential, potential plausible arguments that could delude them. At the end of the chapter, he says this in, chapter, or in verse 23. These same arguments, they indeed have a, an appearance of wisdom, but they have no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. So Paul, uh, in this particular passage, for the, for the rest of the Colossians, he's got all of these uh, exhortations that he's going to give to this young church over and over and over again. He's got a lot to say for how to build their lives on the, the real Lord Jesus. But in this particular passage, he is insisting that they maintain a defensive posture, that they, be, that they would guard the deposit that they've been given. So expect them to be spurred on by Paul and more importantly, by the Holy Spirit. Let's, uh, let's read Colossians 2, starting in verse 6 through the end of the chapter. <clears throat> Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy or empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised, with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you were dead in your trans trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made alive together Though you were dead in your trespasses, in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all our trespasses. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in question of food and drink with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going in details about visions, puffed up without reason, by a sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you are still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perished as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and the severity to the body, but they have no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Let's pray as we open up God's word. Heavenly Father, we trust you that, that your word is good through and through and that you have a word for us, even me as I speak. So feed us, O oh God, even now. Speak as your servants listen and would we be nourished on the gospel in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, 
You must watch out for BBs on the horizon. That's what 97-year-old Jim Downing said to a group of campus outreach staff when they traveled to Colorado Springs um, to, to learn from him. Jim Downing was a, a lifetime navigator staff, which is a college ministry, and um, also the second oldest, at the time, the second oldest living Pearl Harbor survivor. So when he said, look out for BBs on the horizon, he explained to them, he said, I was at Pearl Harbor, and when the Japanese kamikazes were on their way, they looked like BBs on the horizon. They didn't look dangerous at all. And as they got a little bit closer, you could tell that they were planes. But then when it was too late, we realized that they were enemy combatants. If you're going to be good spiritual leaders, he said, you've got to watch out for BBs on the horizon. That's the same message that Paul has for the Colossians here. Just as they have received Christ, he is telling them, now you've got to guard that with your life. That deposit must be guarded with your very life. And you've got to watch out for BBs on the horizon. You have, in effect, what he's saying is, you have received the real Jesus, Colossians. You have received the real Jesus, Emmanuel Church. And because of that, we must guard ourselves from seductive outside influences. So first, he says, we must guard ourselves first by continuing in Christ. Verses six and seven. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him. It's the first sentence. Most commentators say this is the crux of the book of Colossians. Everything pivots from here on out. He was, originally, he was talking about their position in Christ and their new identity in Christ. And now, because that is true, he's getting into what, how we must live and what we must do. This in him is not a new statement in Colossians, and he's going to continue to use it. Here's a couple of ways he's used this idea of in him so far in the book of Colossians. Chapter 1, verse 14. In him we have received redemption. Verse 16. In him all things were created. Verse 19. In him all the fullness of God dwells. Verse 22. He has reconciled us in his body of flesh. Chapter 2, verse 3, in him all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge dwell. For the first part of, uh, of Colossians, he's talked about being in Christ mainly in terms of the supremacy of Jesus. He is supreme in all wisdom and knowledge and creation. And he's talked about being in Christ in terms of salvation. Now we're in him and we're reconciled to God. This walk in him is different. He says, this walk in him is not about salvation, but now it's about sanctification. Now, how do we grow in Christ? And how do we grow in Christ? We walk in him. He's he's basically mirroring the message that he has to the Galatians. Um, He's answering the question, now that I have come to Christ, how am I to conduct Myself, myself, but his tone here is very, very different. Here's what he says to, to the Galatians. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but that there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Chapter, Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 and 3. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Verse 3, are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? So in the chronology of things, the book of Galatians comes first. Paul had had his interaction with that church first. And there was no BBs on the horizon in in Galatia. 
Things were exploding. False teaching had crept in. The whole church, uh, as it was, was in imminent danger, and he had to come with a lot of really tough love to that church. I think Paul, in his prison cell, hearing word of the, the faith of these Colossians, is saying, I've seen this go poorly. I know what happens when when a church takes their eyes off of Jesus, don't be that church. As you have received Christ, so walk in him. And it's the the flaw of our very humanity in an attempt to, to grow, in an attempt to advance spiritually or in some other way, we are so prone to forget God. Paul's saying, don't do that. Don't be that. And let me just say this. If you have come to a place in your faith where you have graduated from Christ, it's not Christ that you received. You've received something else altogether. In, uh, in the screw tape letter, C.S. Lewis uh, puts this kind of sentiment very similarly. If you would remember, he is writing from the perspective of an elder demon discipling uh, training, teaching up a younger demon on how to basically ruin this guy's life, how to ruin this human being's life. And what he tells this younger demon in this particular portion is slowly but surely, just, just continuously distract him with other things. And the, the younger demon isn't convinced. So he says this, you can, it's going to be up on the screen there. You will say that these are very small sins, and doubtless, like all young tempters, remember it's two demons dialoguing, like all young tempters, you are anxious to be able to report spectacular wickedness. But do remember, the only thing that matters is the extent to which you separate the man from the enemy. It does not matter how small the sins are, provided that their cumulative effect is to edge the man away from the light, that is Jesus, and out into the nothing. Murder is no better than cards, if cards can do the trick. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one. The gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. What C.S. Lewis is getting to here is this idea of complacency. And complacency is a killer. And Paul sees that for this young Colossian church. And what he's saying is, don't keep your head on a swivel. We, We must never forget Christ. We must never be complacent in our walks with Christ. And just as you have received him with thanksgiving and joy and awe, you must continue to walk in him in that same way. And he explains how. We'll look at two of the ways he says we do this. Just as we have seen Christ Jesus, so walk in him, how? Rooted and built up in him. So Paul here is now intentionally going back and forth into this uh, uh, agricultural and architectural analogies. He's intentionally saying being rooted and he's, he's, he's making us think of how a plant grows and then he's saying built up and he's making us think about how structures or buildings are, 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 are put together. So how do, we, how do we continue on in Christ in Paul's eyes? We remain rooted in Christ. There are some organic ways in which we are called to grow in Jesus as believers. And a plant grows in a particular environment. There must be water and light and, and, and dirt. There must be the right temperatures for a given plant. And as long as that plant is in that right environment and, and given these particular elements, it's going to grow. Slowly but surely, it will grow. 
So he says rooted. The last thing he says is, uh, the next thing he says is built up, not just the organic way that we are to continue in, in Christ, but also the orchestrated way, the intentionality that we are to have. No building, just because you put it in the right place and gave it the right sunlight, just becomes a skyscraper, or a, an impressive structure. That's not the way that works. There's an immense amount of intentionality in order to build a building. And Paul says, if you want to continue in Christ, if you want to walk in Christ, there is an organic and an orchestrated element to these things. So a couple things. We've got to continue. You have got to continue to put yourself in the environments that lend themselves to growth. That's why we gather on Sunday mornings and worship together with the saints, sing to our God and hear the preached word, because it is the environment that is conducive to us growing in Christ. And especially when we are weary and heavy laden, especially when we, when we sin and need a savior, especially when everything in our life is going really, really poorly, we've got to, con- the very moments we want to take ourselves out of the environment of growth is when we need to be in there the most. We've got to continue uh, to put ourselves in the environments of grace. That is church, obviously, small groups, um, Bible studies, the- men and women's theology and the like. And then secondly, we've got we've to steal back portions of our time. For, for the Christian, a devotional life with Jesus is not a good add-on. It is an essential must-have. And right now in the farmer house, we have this one-year-old kid that, that kind of runs the show. And sometimes he wakes up at 5.30 in the morning and will not stop screaming until you pick him up. The temptation for us is, man, I'll spend time with Jesus another time or later on in the day or whatever. I'm just going to, I'm just going to do the family thing right now. And slowly but surely, days and days go by and we are not intentionally building ourselves up in Christ. What Paul is saying here is stop. Whatever you've got to do to steal back time for you to walk with God, you must do it. Your life is not too busy for you to spend time with Jesus, period. And that's everybody in here, myself included. <clears throat> okay, so first, uh, we, we must guard ourselves by continuing on in Christ. That's the first thing that he gives us. Next, he says, we must guard ourselves from worldly philosophy. This is verses 8 through 15 we're looking at. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive by worldly philosophy. See to it, that is make sure, put your head on the swivel. Again, there are BBs on the horizon. We must look out and here's what some of them look like. They want to take you captive, that is take you by the hand and slowly drift you away on a different course or wrap you up and throw you over the shoulder and and walk in a totally different direction. They wanna take you captive, how? By worldly philosophy by empty deceit. Um, now, what does he mean by philosophy? The, the basic attempt of philosophy, that is secular philosophy, is to fill you with a worldview that A, makes sense of your experience, and then B, gives you some kind of hope and some kind of life, right? So, so whatever the philosophy is, whatever the philosopher is, he is trying to make sense of his own or her own experience, and therefore their readers in, 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 by, by way of, and then try to give you some kind of life going, going forward. Now, most of us are not uh, looking in the direction of Plato or Descartes or Socrates or something like that in, in, for, for, for philosophy, but as of 2018, The self-help industry is about a $13.2 billion industry. In the self-help industry, we can learn about everything from weight loss to parenting to marriage and time management, home management, etiquette, success, self-control, mind power, whatever that is, grief, uh, grief and self-medicine. There are these seductive philosophies about how to make your life more full and more 
complete. And it's really not new. In 1859, a guy by the name of Samuel Smiles wrote a book entitled (laughs) Self-Help. This is the description of his book, Self-Help. It's a collection of inspirational stories by hard, about hardworking men rising through the ranks. I'm sure, it was, uh, I'm sure that was riveting. In 1859, that was the second best-selling book in the United States, outside of the Bible. Uh, G.K. Chesterton, the English theologian, he said this, about self-help books. And it sounds like I'm bashing them. Self-help books in and of and by themselves are not horrible, but they shouldn't be the main thing. This is what G.K. Chesterton said. He said, they are books showing men how to succeed in everything, but they are written by men who cannot even succeed in writing books. (laughs) Now that's a little bit harsh. It's a little bit harsh, Um, but but the point is, um, these are the types of philosophies of our day that that kind of, they they, they seduce our attention, and if we're not careful, um, we've looked at hours of YouTube videos on a certain subject, or we've read a handful of these books that are going to help us organize our closet or uh, do whatever the, the new thing is, and we look up and we spend no time with Jesus. Here's, a, here's another way that uh, philosophy, that the, a new version of philosophical empty um, deceit. Frankly, it's, it's our news outlets. And that is Fox News or CNN or MSNBC or you, you name whatever the thing is. And here's how the news outlets um, do that. They take a particular uh, political bend, and they spend every news story to fit whatever their worldview already is. So that regardless of what, what news channel you're tuned into and what news story is on, the answer to the story is either we need greater regulations on the rich so, uh, so that, that the rich need to be taxed more so that the poor uh, can be provided for, or we need less governmental interference, small government so that uh, trickle-down economics can do its work. And neither one of them are a full depiction of what's needed. And I think Christ would have something to say to both of them. So don't be carried away. Don't be held captive by any philosophy or empty deceit. Why? Verse 9, for in him, that is in Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him. He is very intentionally saying, look out for empty deceit. Why? Because you're full already, Christian. You already have Jesus. So, the emptiness of Christ the, the, uh, I'm sorry, the emptiness of worldly philosophy and empty deceit is compared to the fullness that we have gotten in Christ. We've been handed over the fullness of Jesus. He lives in us. So we shouldn't be spending more time with Robert Kiyosaki than we do with Jesus. Comparatively, it's empty. He gives us a second reason also, verses 11 through 15. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. Verse 13. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him. So not only does uh, worldly philosophy, is it empty in substance, it's empty in sustenance is what Paul is saying. It cannot give you the life that it promises, but guess what? If you're in Christ, 
You've already been given life. You, have, you were literally dead in your trespasses and sins and now have been made alive. It is the most radical transformation a human being can go through. If you're in Jesus, you've already gone through that. What are you looking for on the outside? What are, what are, what are the political pundits or the um, self-help gurus offering to you that Christ hasn't already done in you. And if you continue on in Christ, the transformation continues. They can't do that. The empty philosophy and deceit, they can't, they can't offer you what Christ has already given you. You are full and in a sense have already experienced a resurrection. And then lastly, we must guard ourselves from religious imposition. Verses 16 through 23. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you. Verse 18, let no one disqualify you. He, he starts going into this list of really particularly religious uh, oppressive elements that will potentially threaten the church. And what is, a, what is this kind of religiosity? What is religious legalism? What does it look like and what does it feel like? Verse 16, it looks judgmental. Let no one judge you. Verse 18, it looks disqualifying and insistent. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and so forth. Verse 20, it looks oppressive. He says, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? He's saying, it's kind of like Angela from The Office. <laughs> Nobody likes Angela, right? She is, she is easily the worst character on The Office. She's super judgmental, she's rude, and she happens to be the only Christian character. It's a meme of what the world thinks of Christianity. When they think of you and me, they think they're a bunch of nose-in-the-sky do-gooders who impose all these rules on other people. That's what they think of us. And what Paul says is, you have got to resist that kind of um, uh, religious uh, bourgeoisie that looks down on its nose uh, at, at, other, uh, at other people. And then what, are the, what is the substance of, of their kind of religious oppression? Where does the judgment come from? From a variety of things. And if we had time, we could look through some of the nuances of these things. But he says this, verse 16, let no one look down on you for food and drink or with regard, regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath or verse 18, asceticism, the worship of angels, visions, so on and so forth. Do not taste, do not touch in verse, in verse 20. The attempt of religious legalism is to control you via guilt, to guilt you so much into submission for whatever their particular way and practice is. Today, specifically in the reformed world, there are many really strong opinions on beautiful things like baptism and the Lord's Supper. Um, and, and foolishly, we can argue about those things until they break our fellowship. And this is nothing new. In, in the early 1500s, Martin Luther, who is, as you know, just a chief reformer that did really awesome things um, in totality, but he had a major, or what he thought was a major disagreement with another really influential reformer, Erlwick Zwingli. And this is in the midst of the, them, the, the Reformation break away from the Catholic Church and some of its errors of, of the time. And um, a, a brother that knew both Martin Luther and Erlwick Zwingli wanted to call them together, a man by the name of Philip Melanchthon. 
And he wanted to call them together to settle this dispute they had about the Lord's Supper. And he, he knew that if they could settle that dispute on the Lord's Supper, that they could, their camps could, could run together and they would be stronger because of it. So Martin Luther and his crew and Erwick Zwingli and his crew come to Philip Melanchthon and they start hammering out these 15 points about the Lord's Supper, 15 different theological nuances that they believed about the Lord's Supper. At the end of those days of deliberation, they agreed on 14 and four fifths of a point. No, seriously, 14 and four fifths of a point they agreed on. They could not agree on one fifth of one point and Martin Luther declared Erwick Zwingli anathema. He's not a brother, he's not a Christian, I can't have fellowship with him. Not too long afterwards, Erwick Zwingli, along with many of his other boys, were killed in battle. And it's said that, which was the point of Philip Melanchthon's uh, bringing them together, it is said that if they would have joined forces with, with Luther, they probably wouldn't have died. Um, Paul's message here, it mirrors again his message to the Galatians. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, it is for freedom, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Brothers and sisters, it is a form of slavery to insist that the eternal God fit into your theological categories. He's just too big for him. At the end of the day, he is God and we are not, and he will do exactly as he pleases. We've got to leave room for that. In closing, I had a, had a friend in high school I played football with. We had a pretty decent football team um, my senior year. And earlier, he played running back. A few years before, he played running back. And he was a great running back. He, could, he was really fast. He ended up playing Division I football up in the north, uh, Northeast. Um, but he ended up playing cornerback. He played on the defensive side of the ball. He was really fast. He was really strong. But he always fumbled the football. I mean, the football was like a bar of soap in his hands. Like, <laughs> and and the, the sad thing is, Every time he'd get hit, the ball would pop out and he would fake an injury and limp off to the side. And you just knew exactly what was going on. It's like, nah, you're not hurt. You're just, it's what we used to call the loser's limp. Um, and and he, was, he was everything that you would want in a running back, fast, smart, um, agile, strong, but he could not hold on to the football. And, if, and finally, our coach benched him and said, you can't do this. You, you, can't, you can't run the ball. Why? You don't value it. If you really knew the value of what you had and the, the value of every possession that we have, then you would protect that thing. You would guard it, you would hold it with both hands and you would guard it. Christian, do you know that the Lord Jesus holds you like that? That he sees you as so precious that he would, he would tuck you into his nearest heart and guard you. And what he says to us is, just as you have received this same gospel, you must guard it. You must guard it from the, the fadding philosophy of the day, whatever the fad is, and you must guard it from, from institutional religious rigidity. We must guard the gospel with our very lives because it's that precious. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for the truth of the gospel and the goodness of the gospel. And just as you hold us dearly, just as you hold us in the deepest parts of your heart, and as your word says that nothing can pluck us from your hand, so would we hold on to you. Not merely things about you, not truths about you, but to you, the real you. Would we not go beyond Christ into other things? 
And, and Lord, would we not fall short of you? But just as we have received you, would we walk in you? Pray in Christ's name. Amen.
foundation shake driving wind or raging sea neither death nor life can take my redeemer's love from me through this world through this world's few passing days and through all eternity Thank you, Will, Tess Band. Just such filled with glory and goodness and the word of God today. Oh, we're in him and with him. It's not up to us to hang on, is it? He's already got us in his arms. So we're so thankful for today and the word and the music and the coming together and the prayer. Let's be filled and go out of here blessed. Well, I got one thing to give away today, in fact, Eight things. I have eight seats to Brahms Violin Concerto. Um, and and they're, they're kind of together, so if there's two of you and you want two, or you, and there's six or four and four, or and if you want all eight, just let me know. I'll be up here, and um, they're free, and you can have them. So I already gave away some other tickets. Um, somebody who came in first uh, came to the front, and so those people in the back that sit back there and come in late, in order to get free tickets, you've got to come in early, <laughs> down front. So just, just saying. Uh, today is a college lunch. Uh, free lunch. Those are the two best words of any college kid ever. Free and lunch. So that's today, right afterwards, in the gathering place, um, don't, can't tell you where to go, but follow the breadcrumbs on the way down. Just go right through there. And uh, Andrew, are you in here? Or are you probably prepared somewhere? Um, if you aren't, Andrew Christenberry, thank you. And John's going to help lead you through there. Guest reception is today. And uh, TJ's already back in the guest reception waiting. And if you're a new, or as we like to say, newish, um, come and introduce yourself. And come in there and meet with the pastor. So we'd be so glad to introduce you. So we want to have the benediction. Benediction simply means been a good diction words. And these, this good word comes down from God to us. It's a blessing. And Aaron, the high priest, was given these words from Moses and said, speak these words to the people of Israel and they shall be blessed. And these are the exact words out of Numbers chapter 6. And so raise up your hands as we receive this good word, blessing from God Almighty. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord smile upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show his favor to you and give you peace. Now go in peace with his blessing. God bless you.